forget to do that. Um, first quick announcement is that um, I sent the class an email yesterday afternoon, um, just letting you know where we're at and what's coming. I, I've been doing that pretty much this entire semester, just hopefully to help you with you know time management and what you have on your plate um, for each particular course. So if you haven't checked your email yet, don't sweat it. It's the weekend. You have all weekend to check your email, okay? So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about section 3.7. Essentially, my plan is today and Monday, we're gonna do 3.7. Wednesday, we're gonna do 3.8. And I'll talk a bit about your last test. And then Friday, I'm just gonna answer questions, talk about your last test, et cetera. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, well, before I begin, I want to do an example. Um, and let me share my screen so Finn can see it as well. So this is an example in section 3.3. Okay, great. You can now see my application. Cool. So. Um, what we want to do is we want to find an equation for this polynomial, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to note the graph, and I'm going to write down all my information right here, and then I'll stop sharing my screen, okay? So first thing that I note are my zeros. One zero is at negative two. Another zero is at one and another zero is at three. Do you agree that it touches at negative two, it touches at one, but it crosses at three? Now, remember, we always need one more ordered pair that this thing goes through, and a uh, ordered pair that we have is the y-intercept, it passes through zero, three. You with me this far? All righty. Well, first off, if negative two is a zero, would you grant me that x plus two is a factor? If one is a zero, would you agree that x minus one is a factor? And finally, if three is a zero, x minus three is a factor. You good this far? Awesome. So I've got some value A, got to figure out my leading coefficient. So X plus two, since it touches, what do I raise this to? The second power. X minus one, since this touches, I have an exponent of two. And since this crosses, don't I have an exponent of one? Okay, questions this far. Now we just got to find the value of A. This is where we plug in the other ordered pair that's given to us. So I'm going to say that Y is three when X is zero. All right, well, let's see. Zero plus two is two and two squared is four. Zero minus one is negative one, and negative one squared is positive one. And what is zero minus three? Negative three. So do you agree if I multiply my numbers on my right side, I get negative 12a? Right. So to get A alone, I divide both sides by negative 12. So don't I get A to be negative one fourth? Cool. Awesome. Yay. Ross, thank you. 
No, I'm serious. I mean, you're so diligent about doing your homework and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your questions. Just a ton. All right. Let's talk about rational functions. Now, one thing that I wanna say is in section 3.3, .3, when we were graphing our polynomials, in the end, we had a series of steps that we would go through in order to um, find the graph, right? We would find our intercepts, look at the multiplicities, et cetera, okay? So while they were complicated looking functions, we actually had steps that we could go through with which to um, find uh, what our graph looked like, okay? We're gonna have the same thing with rational functions as well. It's just gonna take us a little longer to get there. So what I wanna do is at least spend the first part of class talking about a couple different ideas. I've mentioned both of these before in exponentials and logs, but they really come to light here with rational functions. So your first question might be, what's a rational function? Reasonable question to ask. I'll call it R of X, R for rational. You can name it anything you want. Essentially, it's one polynomial divided by another polynomial. So you have a polynomial in your numerator and you have a polynomial in your denominator. But notice if we're dividing, you gotta watch for domain, right? You can never have your denominator equal to zero. Remember domains from the beginning of the term, okay? It's totally illegal to divide by zero. So we're gonna have uh, domain issues here. So in order to get a feel for what our, happens with some of our rational functions. I'm gonna go way back to the very beginning of the semester and look at one of our particular toolkit functions, okay? One of them was one over X. This has a name, um, it's called your reciprocal function, okay? Because if you plug in X, what we're doing is we're taking the reciprocal of it, okay? What we're gonna do is just very quickly go through the graph and talk about some characteristics of the graph, and then I'll generalize. This is considered the most basic of your rational functions. I'll grant you that these are both monomials, not polynomials, because there's only one term in each, okay? What can X not be equal to? Zero, right? Do you agree? That would zero out my denominator. That's forbidden, okay? We're gonna get really into talking about where our denominator is equal to zero, where it's undefined. So let's just plug in a few numbers to get a feel for it. If I plug in X equals one, what comes out? One. If I plug in X equals two, well, one over two is one half. What if I plug in X equals a thousand? What's gonna come out? One over 1,000. You see how I'm plugging these in? Okay, notice it's just taking the reciprocal. What if I plug in negative, or not negative, I'm staying positive right now. What if I plug in one half? It's two. We know the reciprocal of one half is two, but look, one over one half, when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. If I plug in one third, well, what's one over one third? It's three. What if I plug in one one thousandth? Someone else tell me what's going to come out. A thousand. 
Well, let's see what happens when we plug in some negative numbers and then we'll plot all these guys. If I plug in negative one, I claim very similar things happen. If I plug in x equals negative one, what comes out? Negative one. If I plug in negative two, won't I have negative one half? If I plug in negative a thousand, what am I going to have? Negative one over a thousand. And similar things happen when we plug in fractions. What if I plug in negative one half? What's going to come out? Beautiful, negative two. And if I plug in negative one over 1,000, negative 1,000 is going to come out. Can one over X actually ever be equal to zero? No, this is never actually equal to zero, although it gets pretty darn close to zero. Right? Notice a fraction can only be equal to zero when your numerator is zero. And our numerator here is constantly one. All right, so let's see what this graph looks like and then talk about some characteristics of it. I'll plot my points. We have one, one. We have two, one half. We have one half up at two. And what we'll see is it looks like this, and it looks like that, right? When we plugged in um, one one thousandth, we got a thousand coming out. So like here, we're way up there. And if you plug in the negative values, a similar thing is going to happen. All right, let's talk about this, okay? Notice, as x is going to either positive or negative infinity, aren't our function values approaching zero? Right, as x is getting really big, my function's getting super close to zero. And as x gets really small, my function's also approaching zero. So going back to our exponential functions, you may or may not recall, but we say that y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote. Okay, now formally speaking, you have a horizontal asymptote. We're talking about long run behavior. Essentially we're asking, as x gets really big and really small, does my function value approach some number? If that's the case, then y equals that number is going to be your horizontal asymptote. So again, this is only talking about the long run behavior. It turns out, you can touch or cross your horizontal asymptote in the interim, not here, obviously, because when we talk about horizontal asymptotes, what we're really talking about is the long run behavior. What happens is X gets really, really big or really, really small. Hey. Now, we also had something really interesting happen. Notice in this graph, as x approaches zero, remember, zero is our forbidden point, right? That's what made my denominator equal to zero. Well, what happened as we approach zero? Well, as we approach zero from the right, 
what happens to our function? It shoots up to positive infinity, doesn't it? And as we approach zero from the left side, what's my function doing? It's going to negative infinity. So technically speaking, you have a vertical asymptote at x equals some value if as x approaches that value, your function either shoots up to positive infinity or shoots down to negative infinity. Now let's be pragmatic about things. How do you find them in general when you're dealing with rational functions, okay? So to find your vertical asymptote, Notice our vertical asymptote here was x equals zero. Notice that's precisely where it was undefined. So that's exactly how you find it. The way you find your vertical asymptote is you set your denominator equal to zero and solve. You can have multiple vertical asymptotes as you'll see next week or even today, okay? It's wherever it's undefined, it's the forbidden place. And I wanna add that you can never touch or cross your vertical asymptote because then you're saying that you could have plugged in that value. To find your horizontal asymptote, this can be proven in a calculus class. So at this point, what I'm gonna tell you is um, just trust me. I don't lie about math. Okay, now to find your horizontal asymptote, it depends entirely the on the degrees of your numerator and denominator. And you're gonna to wanna to have these steps in front of you, of course, until you get so practiced out that you remember it even if you didn't want to. So let me go through this. If the degree of your numerator is greater than the degree of your denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. Now remember with horizontal asymptotes, we're asking what happens as X gets really, really big and really, really small. So just as an example, what if I have like Y equals X cubed plus one over X plus a hundred? Do you agree that the degree of my numerator is greater than the degree of my denominator? Right, this is degree three, this is degree one. So notice as X gets really big, is it my numerator gonna grow a heck of a lot faster than my denominator because I'm cubing it? Okay, so as X gets super duper big, my numerator is gonna grow a heck of a lot faster than my denominator. So we're not going to be able to approach some number, we're gonna fly off to infinity. As X gets really small in this case, we're gonna be shooting down to negative infinity, okay? Because the degree here overpowers the degree here, you're not gonna have a horizontal asymptote. It turns out, if the degree of your numerator is less than the degree of your denominator, your horizontal asymptote is always y equals zero.
as in the example we just saw. But if I just take this guy here, do you agree the degree of my numerator is less than the degree of my denominator? As X gets super duper big, isn't my denominator the one getting super duper big? And when your denominator gets large, doesn't this thing go to zero? Right, I mean, would you rather be able to eat a half a pizza or a 15th of a pizza? Notice as your denominator gets bigger, your number gets smaller, okay? That's why it's always y equals zero. Does that make sense? Again, if you take a calculus class, you're actually going to prove all this stuff in there. At this point, I'm just saying, trust me. Okay, finally, if the degree of my numerator is equal to the degree of my denominator, you will also have a horizontal asymptote. And your horizontal asymptote will be y equals the ratio of your leading coefficients. Maybe that's just a mouthful of words, but essentially what you do, the leading coefficients are the numbers in front of your X value to the highest degree. And that's because you, if they're the same, your numerator and denominator are gonna grow at the same rate. So it just goes to that fraction. All right, so what I want to do right now is just stop and practice finding vertical and horizontal asymptotes, because that's really the new thing in this section. Okay, you ready? So all we're doing is we're finding our asymptotes. How do I find my vertical asymptote here? You set your denominator equal to zero. So my vertical asymptote is X equals three. Whatever your denominator is, you set it equal to zero. Right, to find your vertical asymptote, set your denominator equal to zero. How about to find my horizontal asymptote? Well, now we look at the degrees. What do I know about the degree of my numerator and the degree of my denominator? They are the same. So it's the ratio of the numbers in front. Well, what's the number in front of X here and here? So do you agree one over one is one? Done. Okay, what if I have y equals 2x plus 3 over 4x plus 7? I have this and two more, and then we're going to expand. Okay, well, let's do our horizontal asymptote first. What do we know about the degrees? They're the same. So it's the ratio of the leading coefficients. So it's y equals one half. Good. Two fourths is one half. There's a question just ask, please. Your vertical asymptote, how do you find your forbidden zone? Well, it's wherever this guy's undefined. And isn't it undefined where your denominator is zero? Remember, that's the place where the math cops come and take you away. You can't have your denominator equal to zero. So do you agree if I solve this for X, I get X to be negative seven fourths?
what if I have y to be oh how about 3x squared minus 5x plus 7 over x squared minus 1. Well, what's my horizontal asymptote? Good job, it's y equals three. The degrees are the same, three over one is three. Vertical asymptote, we get to factor. So I threw this one in. Can we factor x squared minus one? Yeah, it's the difference of two squares. Remember the special one when you have one term squared minus another term squared, you add them and then you subtract them. So do you agree that's x plus one, x minus one? I put this one in there just to make sure we're all hip on this stuff. So in this case, I'm gonna have two vertical asymptotes. What's one of them? One, what's the other one? Negative one. Okay. What if I have y equals seven x to the fifth minus two x plus 73 over x squared plus one? Horizontal asymptote. There is none. Why? Because the degree of my numerator was greater than the degree of my denominator. How about my vertical asymptote? Ah, notice this is x squared plus one. No, 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 you're awesome. That's the, that's the smartest thing to do. What have we done that's familiar? Notice if you have x squared plus one, it can't be factored. But we can move this over to, notice before when we had x squared minus one equals to zero, we could have moved the one over and then taken the square root of both sides and wouldn't we have gotten positive and negative one? If I move my one over here, I'm gonna have x squared be equal to negative one. Now, if I take the square root of both sides, what are you going to say? Can't do it. Can't take the square root of a negative number. In other words, be prepared that some will not have asymptotes. It's kind of the moral of that, Stuart. All right. What I'm gonna do is just practice a few more of these, but I'm also gonna bring in intercepts because intercepts are the other big deal thing that we have, okay? So what I want us to do is find our horizontal asymptote, vertical asymptotes and intercepts. And let's just take y equals four x over x minus seven. I just want to put this together to be sure that we're all cool with it. Well, let's do our horizontal asymptote. What do I know about the degrees of my numerator and denominator? Same. So what is this equal to? Y equals four. There's a question, just ask. Vertical asymptote, how do you do that? 
Don't you set your denominator equal to zero? So what is that equal to here? Seven. All right, let's find our x-intercept. Recall to find your x-intercept, you set y equal to zero. So we have four x over x minus seven equals zero. Well, friends, your a fraction can only be zero if your numerator is zero, okay? So really all we have to do is solve our numerator equal to zero, and don't we get zero? And how do you find your y-intercept? You set x equal to zero. Well, if I plug in x equals zero, I have four times zero over zero minus seven. What's that equal to? Zero. You ready? What if I have y equals x squared minus nine over x squared minus three x? One of the things I would recommend you do whenever you're given a rational function in this form is factor it. I would factor it right from the get-go. It's really helpful to have it in this form, and it's also very helpful to have it in factored form. Okay, how do I factor my numerator? Good, it's a difference of two squares, so it's x plus three, x minus three. That's just a guy you gotta memorize. Can I factor my denominator? Yeah, what can I do in my denominator? I can pull out an x and then aren't I left with x minus three? Whoa, check this out. I'm multiplying in my numerator, I'm multiplying in my denominator and don't I have a common factor in both of them? So don't those cancel and this is really just x plus three over x? All right, horizontal asymptote. I mean, you could look at the original one too. The degree of your numerator is the same as the degree of your denominator. What's the ratio of my leading coefficients? One. Vertical asymptote. What's going to make my denominator here equal zero? Zero. X-intercept. How do you find your x-intercept? Don't we set y equal to zero? Remember, a fraction's equal to zero if your numerator is zero. So what is my x-intercept? Negative three. So it's the ordered pair, negative three, zero. And your y-intercept, how do you find your y-intercept? You set x equal to zero, but if we set x equal to zero, we have zero plus three over zero, and that can't happen. So there is none here. Never touches or crosses your y-axis, and of course that makes sense because your y-axis happens to be your vertical asymptote.
All right. Let's do one more of these, and then I'm going to write out the steps to graph our um, rational functions, and we'll see how far we get. Okay. All right. What if I have y equals x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 3x minus 28? Again, once you start having quadratics in there, you want to play around with factoring. Okay. Can I factor my numerator? Yep, we just did it up here. Isn't that x plus 3x minus 3? Can I factor my denominator? I claim the answer is yes. I wouldn't ask otherwise. Well, we need two numbers that multiply to negative 28 and add to negative 3. Good, don't we have a negative seven and a positive four? Now, how do we do that quickly? Just familiarity with numbers. Again, you could write down all of the things that multiply up to 28 and then ask what combination would add up to negative three. If factoring's funky for you, that's something to definitely do this weekend other than eat and sleep. All right, notice we can't cancel anything, but I still claim that this was a very useful activity. It's gonna help us with everything else in this problem. Okay, horizontal asymptote. Y equals one. Why? because the degrees are equal, so it's the ratio of your leading coefficients. Vertical asymptote. How do you find your vertical asymptote? Don't you set your denominator equal to zero? Well, wouldn't you much rather take this factored form and set it equal to zero? Okay, so by factoring it, what we did is we saved ourselves a step later. Well, if I take this and set it equal to zero, I'm actually going to have two vertical asymptotes. What's one of them? And what's the other one? You got it. Okay. Let's find x intercept. How do you find your x intercept? set y equal to zero. But again, remember, a fraction is only equal to zero if your numerator is zero. So all we really need to do is focus on where our numerator is zero. Well, we're gonna have two x-intercepts. What's the first one? Negative three, zero. And what's this other intercept? Positive three, zero. Good thing we factored, saved ourselves a step there too. Last but not least here, we got a y-intercept. How do you find your y-intercept? You plug in x equals zero. Now you could, let me show you, plug in x equals zero in the factored form or in the non-factored form. Honestly, plugging zero in your non-factored form is faster because when you plug in x equals zero, any term with an x goes see you later. So aren't we left with negative nine over negative 28 or nine twenty-eighths? Okay, you could plug in x equals zero here and you'd have three here, negative three here, negative seven here, and four there. 
but regardless, you're going to get negative 9 over negative 28, which is 9 28 nearly a third. Do you all feel comfortable with this so far? Okay, so your steps to graph rational functions. And again, we'll be going from the equation to graphing it. And then we're also going to go from a graph to a possible equation, just like we did with polynomials. Okay, number one, find your y-intercept. We know how to do that. You set x equal to zero and solve. Step two, find your x-intercepts. There's potentially more than one. And what you do to find that is you set y equal to zero, but remember a fraction is only equal to zero if your numerator is zero. You wanna find your horizontal asymptote next and then your vertical asymptote. So everything we've just done is where we begin. And then there's one more thing to do, which is probably one of the longer steps. Take test points as needed. And honestly, when we take test points as needed, there's only one thing that we really care about, okay? We care about whether it's positive or negative, okay? The reason why is it's gonna help us estimate our graph because if it turns out positive, it's gonna be above your x-axis. And if it's negative, it's gonna be below your x-axis. So I got a question. That clock right there says 249, but my clock says 244. Okay, cool. Whew. You're so much better of a person than I am. I would have been like, oh, it's 249, Lauren, time to stop class. <laughs> okay. These are the steps that you want to have. Huh? Um, these four do not have to be in that order, but this is the one that goes last. So what I want to do is just take one example, since we have time to do just one example. You psyched? So what if I have y equals 2x plus 5 over 2x minus 6? Notice we don't have to deal with factoring. I didn't have time to put one. We don't have enough time to factor. OK, so let's just go through these. So let's find our y-intercept. How do you find your y-intercept? You set x equal to zero. Do you agree if I plug in x equals zero, I'm going to be left with negative five-sixths? Right? This term will go away and that term will go away. You with me there? X-intercept. How do you find your x-intercept? You set your numerator equal to zero or y equals zero. So we have to solve 2x plus 5 equals zero. What do we get for x? Negative 5 halves. Of 
horizontal asymptote. What do we know about the degrees here? They're the same. So it's the ratio of my leading coefficients and what is two over two equal to? One. How do you find your vertical asymptote? You set your denominator equal to zero. So two X minus six equals zero. X equals three. You with me this far? Now what I'm gonna do is start drawing my picture. Zero, negative five, six. Well, do you agree negative five, six is almost negative one? See how I plotted that? My x-intercept is negative five halves, in other words, negative two and a half. So it's about right there. Now I'm gonna show my horizontal asymptote. The way you identify that is you do a dashed line. Remember, by definition, your horizontal asymptote is what happens as X gets really big and really small. But you show your asymptotes by dashed lines. And do you agree X equals three is our other asymptote? The vertical asymptote is the untouchable one. You with me this far? Okay. I might run one minute over, but it wouldn't be more than that. Your vertical asymptote splits your graph. Remember our very, very start of the class? We had the graph of one over X and wasn't our graph in two pieces? It's gonna be in two or three pieces, these things, okay? One piece is over here and another piece is over here. Now I want to show you how we get the idea of our asym of what of how helpful our asymptotes are. First off, you play connect the dots. We know that since y equals one is our horizontal asymptote, as x gets really small, we're going to approach that value. That's by definition of being a horizontal asymptote. We know as we approach our vertical asymptote, our function's either going to shoot up to positive infinity or it's going to shoot down to negative infinity. Right? I claim it can't shoot up here. The reason why is if it shot up to positive infinity, wouldn't I have another x intercept right here? And I found my only x intercept. So it's got to shoot down to negative infinity. Now, what we need to do is determine, well, what the heck happens over here? This is where our final step comes in. Take test points as needed. So I'm just going to be simple and I'm going to test x equals four. I just want to test some number that's on the other side of your vertical asymptote. Okay, if it's going to be negative, I know my graph is down here. If it's positive, I know my graph has got to be up there. Okay, so I'm going to test x equals four. I could get the exact value, but honestly, I could care less what the exact value is right? Two times four plus five over two times four minus six. You're going to get 13 halves. Honestly, all I care about is my numerator is positive if I plug in x equals four, as is my denominator. So I know that when x is equal to four, I'm up here somewhere. I don't really care where, because my graphing is not precise anyhow. 
okay? Therefore, as I approach my vertical asymptote from this side, am I gonna shoot up to positive infinity or shoot down to negative infinity? I gotta shoot up, okay? The reason why I've gotta shoot up is if I went down to negative infinity, wouldn't I have another x-intercept? And I don't have another x-intercept there. And by definition, I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals one. So I know that as x gets large, my graph's going to approach one. We've done a lot today. I promise you, for better or for worse, I have a bunch more examples to do on Monday. So what I would suggest you do this weekend is enjoy yourself, of course, practice factoring and make sure you get through section 3.3 if you have not already. Yeah, you did a uh, practice test for the Bible? Mm, perhaps, or I'm gonna outline it pretty darn good. Thanks, Lord. Thank you, I hope you have a great day and a great week.